Finishing off the chapter of the Cold War by the secret team. The important thing was not the size of the project itself or of the CIA operation relative to the gross size of the DOD. Rather, it was the fact that the CIA project was an active operation. It was, in a sense, a major part of the battle of the Cold War. That's the fact that only seven PTV-7s or a few squadrons of U-2s were involved was not the real measure of the impact of the ST. It was the fact that the ST was operational anywhere in the world, fully supported by the element or elements of the DOD and its supporting industrial complex that the CIA needed for its fun and games. <clears throat> Thus, the Western world versus the communist world Cold War was made increasingly more real because the ST was actively, through clandestinely, engaged. There was a French colonel in the 19th century named Dupic who wrote the battles, the early... The great early battles of history were not quite the massive total confrontations that historians have portrayed them to be. On the contrary, they were close-up hand-to-hand clashes of, few, of the few men who were in the contiguous perimeter of opposing forces. Although 60,000 men may have been arrayed on one side, confronted by 80,000 of the advancing enemy, the only men actually engaged at any one time for those in the front line and then only those that formed part of the front line who actually came into physical contact with their counterparts and adversaries. Thus, it was a great task of the general, the man on the white horse, to see that more of his men were in position to engage face-to-face, hand-to-hand, the enemy that were on the other side. Yet the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder mass combat of that time meant only so many men could effectively be crammed into a given area of the same time. And this would roughly be equal for both sides. It was the just juncture that tactics and training began to decide that the course of the battle. As men in the front fell, others directly behind them had to move into the fray. As the course of battle ebbed and flowed, and well-trained, disciplined army would seize the initiative of every turn, not so many dem demonstrating superior power as superior training, equipment, and morale. Thus, the fates of nations and empires rested not so much on huge armies as upon the shoulders of a few men engaged on the perimeter of the battle zone. In that type of combat, before weapons with long range spears, bows, and arrows, and then guns, the battle was won on the perimeter by small circles of men face to face, locked in deadly combat with no choice but to go to forward or die. Until each adversary fell before the physical onslaught, this was essentially a battle of total attrition. With the victory going always to the force that outlasted the foe. Victory was total. It was won by annihilating, annihilating the vanquished. In a certain sense, this is how the Cold War is being fought. It is all too inevitable that the two greatest powers on earth should oppose each other. General Motors has its Ford. Macy's has gimbals. And in nature, positive has negative. So General Motors does not exist. Ford is still here. Macy's is still here and Gimbals is gone. Major forces always oppose each other, then this is normal, even though there was plenty of room for both. They just wanted to build, it was like one taking out the other, and then their production in their mind was always make more, make more, make more than them, do more than them. How can we get their customers? How can we close them down so we make more money? And now Macy's is facing the same with Amazon or some other store, I'm sure. Likely something similar to the Kardashians bullshit. However, Macy's has better, well, I mean, it used to. Who knows? We won't speculate. In a certain sense, that is, wait, let's see. In a certain sense, that is how the Cold War is being fought. It is all too ine inevitable that the two greatest powers, major forces always oppose each other. That is normal. Even without the incessant reminder of real or imagined actual or potential Cold War, a massive contest would inevitably be, exist between the United States and the USSR in all areas of contact. Which we should not lose all sense of proportion as a result of this realization any more than they should. This confrontation is a fact of life. Thus, the battles, large and small of the war, are the local face-to-face -face skirmishes between small, even unnoticed elements on both sides. The battles may be social, economic, athletic, political, religious, and military. Huh. I think that we were in a um, social media war. Uh, economic, for sure. Um, 
Athletic with the World Cup. Political for sure with, um, what do you call it? Blue versus red. Religious. And military. And no matter how large or small, how deadly the, or insignificant, there's only one way to tally up the score and the one and lost column. It is the same way it one scores in chess. The game is won by not losing. As in chess, luck plays no part. The lo loser loses his own game. The winner is simply the man who is there at the end. Mm, I definitely know that that's going to be me. Even though this morning they tried to get me to stay in bed all day. Um, they're trying to make me look unattractive. They're attempting to get me to not put, Literally, come on. Come on. Taking two weeks off. Give me a break. Like, I give two craps about his content. I only get so far with what he produces, and I make 100 videos a day. Off of eight. You think that's off of a one three-minute video? And we'll even stretch it out to say nine minutes. Thus, the Cold War is a massive, totally grim game of attrition. The loser will be the one who has dissipated all of his resources. The winner will be the one who remains with his force relatively intact. The great and terrible truth is that in this type of warfare, the loser may be the victim of deadly attrition brought about as a result of his own futile actions. <laughs> it's all over the internet. You've already posted it as evidence to what you've been up to. And then I've just basically been a secret team analysis and then analyze, and analyze it for everyone to see. As you look at my pearls. <laughs> This is how you cook spinach. The great and terrible truth is that in this type of warfare, the loser may be the victim of deadly attrition brought about as a result of his own futile actions as much as or even more than by actions of an enemy. Consider the battles of the Cold War are all waged against the enemy communism. In the Berlin airlift, for example, there may have been a short of local victory, but in this true measure of victory in a war between the great powers of the U.S. that paid very heavily in the USSR that made little more than verbal onslaughts, on the scale of relative total attrition, the United States went down and the USSR went up. In this type of scoring, the up is relative. So my, if you want to call it branding, is that I post hundreds of videos a day. That in itself shows that I will win because your brand is not that. You are embarrassed to even post three videos, much less one video. And that one video takes you a whole day and the video is like one minute long. Meaning you're not producing any information As a government connection, you tell the media. However, I'm producing new information by historical events from their information that you placed, and then I'm showing what you're doing now and associating association what you said in the past to show you how the Cold War is working as a manipulation game because you didn't think that people would go into the past documentation records to show the truth, much less find the truth. And these are words coming straight out of Obama's mouth. And then the media is getting calls to tell you information based on Cold War effects that are against what Obama regime has said in the past or it's evidence to show you how they are misguiding the nation. And yet you still say nothing, Fox. Or look at the score of the massive special operation into the rebellion in Indonesia. Against the battle was waged against communism. The cost of the United States was very great, which much greater than most people realize because so much of what actually took place 
was concealed quite effectively from American people. Although it was unknown, not unknown to the Indonesians, the Chinese and the Russians, and for that matter, to any other country that the, choose to know, as a result of the costly Cold War battle, again, the attrition of the United States was considerable that the USSR was negligible. negligible. The pay of pigs was another such major battle. We made a great investment in resources in our world prestige. Russia's contribution was, again, little more than words, and there were more than words of Castro than the men in the Kremlin. Even after the gross failure of the battle, the United States lost further in the tribute it paid in the sum of more than 53 million for the release of the Cuban patriots who had been captured by Castro. It's kind of interesting because we had Brittany Griner. Another Cold War propaganda move. It might be pointed out, and except that we got an innocent soldier Innocent soldier being held. One head hit. You have to, I don't know, we'll talk about it later. But he's definitely, it's, he's, it's time for him to get out. And Putin said, yeah. You're in? You're in for eventually letting him go soon? <laughs> when we make amends, yes. It might be pointed out here that it is not so much monetary and other costs of such a secret operation. It could have been... It could have been a clandestine, I didn't know the results. That kind of operation. And then he takes the fall. Just to let you know. No, I'm not going to be cautious. Y'all are ridiculous. <clears throat> Let's see. I like him. You better be nice to him. Anyway. It might be pointed out here that there that it is not so much mon monetary and other costs of such a secret operation that are important as in the fact that like the battles of old, it is a ratio in the Cuban operation, 53 million to zero, which is so deadly. This has been the scoring of the Cold War almost all the way along. When Khrushchev, 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 no more than threatened Western Europe with medium range rockets after the outstretch of the Suez attack in 1956, he set off a flurry in the country to create a weapon that up to that time had never been considered essential. This led to the hasty and fruitless development of the immediate, intermediate range ballistic missile. Hundreds and millions of dollars were spent on those rockets. Rickets in the Soviet Union. And except for their bonus payoff as power system for certain space projects, the Jupiter, Thor, and Polaris programs were all hasty, con hasty tributes to the Cold War threat. Again, the U.S. attrition was in the billions of dollars, and the USSR loss was little more than the bluster of an angry Khrushchev. The Cold War has been brought along in the perimeter of the zones of communism and of the free world along that is called the Iron Curtain. The Northern Tier and the Bamboo Curtain. In a very special sense, it has been fought like ancient wars by those few who actually brush against the hotspots. If anything was ever a better example of the brutality of this type of conflict than the operation in Indochina, which was taken during the past two decades, it would be hard to find here again the contribution of the United States. The terrible attrition of our national wealth, prestige, manpower, and money has been stupendous. It is, rare, it is really unparalleled in the history of warfare. One nation has lost so much and a stated adversary has lost and contributed so little. The United States has lost more than 55,000 men and the USSR has lost none. The United States has lost more than 200 billion and perhaps much more if the gross cost is included in this total and the Soviet Union has lost a few billion at the most. Only enough to assure that we would not lose heart and leave. Unless there was any early realization of these significant facts, 
With it, a major change in the course of events in this country with this massive conflict may well be the last one of the stage of civilization. Um, they have to have more money. You know why? They have to. They have, like, have you seen the size of Russia? Have you seen the size of Russia? So they're basically telling me you want to be the number one superpower in the world and you want to hurt innocent Russians who are just living their lives because you want to look cool. By all indications now, it is moving. And that goes for China, too, because there's more people in China, I think. Although, they're trying to make this country... I'm sure they're also trying to get soldiers, Nicaraguans. And that goes for you, Puerto Rico. And they don't care about you. I care about you, though. I mean, let's, let's take a look at the money they sent for you during your post, what do you call it? And don't you be right in the streets either. Anyway, <clears throat> by the all indications now, it is moving on relentlessly to a conclusion of a doom for the U.S. As in a terrible human chess game, the loser is giving up all of his men as a result of his own errors, and the winner is doing little more than waiting out the game and keeping up the relentless pressures. This is why is it important to see how the early small-scale contests between the Operational forces under direction of the ST began to stir between, to stir the sleeping giant of the Defense Department into an ever ascending crescendo of Cold War activity. With such minor events as the worldwide program of the P2V7 and all that is involved, with this much more significant U2 program escalating from its first tenuous born border excursion to the final flight by Gary Powers. In May of 1960, the ST was prepared itself for other operations, such one larger and grander than the one that came before. And each time the ST prepared a new operation, it was a catal catalytic force that spurred the passive counter-punching military establishment further into the quagmire of massive attrition. By 1958, things had gone so far along these lines that the CIA was able to get itself involved in its most ambitious foreign operation. Contact had been made with an attach from Indonesia in Washington. This is not an unusual thing, and the CIA and the Department of State and the Defense Department are frequently in contact with foreign individuals and groups who believe selfishly, and in most instances, that with the help of the U.S., they can take over their own communist-oriented government. In the case of the Indonesian attached, the CIA was willing and ready to sound out him out further because it believed the removal of Sukarno from in power of Indonesia would return the major Asian nation to the non-communist family of nations. The anti-communist war cry looked especially good there. Rebel leaders from one end to the Indonesia chain to the other were encouraged to organize and to plan a major rebellion against Sukarno. Sukarno. Meanwhile, the CIA prepared for most ambitious peacetime operation and headquarters was established in Singapore and training bases were set up in the Philippines, an old World War II airfield in a deserted island in the Southwest Pacific was reactivated and other airstrips on remote Philippine territories were prepared for bomber and transport operations. Vast stores of arms and equipment were assembled in Okinawa and the Philippines. Indonesia, Filipinos, Chinese Americans, and other soldiers of fortune were assembled in Okinawa and in the Philippines also to support the cause. The U.S. Army took part in training the rebels, and the Navy furnished over the beach submarine backed up support. The Air Force provided transport aircraft and prepared the fleet of modified B-26 bombers. The B-26 is a light bomber in modern terms, but it had been fitted with a nose assembly for eight 50 caliber machine guns. That is a this is a power pack punch. For this type of warfare, a small fleet of Korean War B-26s was prepared and the number of covert crews were assembled to fly them. Go away. I'm so sick of y'all. It's like annoying. Y'all are well, like Im imps. Imps. It's like pathetic. Disgusting. Nasty. It's like, ugh. 
In the beginning, rebellion broke out in various parts of the island chain and loyalist forces were forced to deal with them one at a time while the Indonesian army under the command of General Nazation, Na, Nazu, Nazushin began an attack upon the rebels on the main island of Sumatra. It seemed that the rebel cause would be victorious on the other islands. However, the inability of the rebels to win decisive victories and to enlist the aid of, aid of neutrals, which the regular forces of the government, turned the war back gradually in favor of the Loyalist Army. The struggle was protected and the CIA threw everything into everything it had into the attack. Tens of thousands of rebels were armed and equipped from the air and over the beach. But at no time were the rebels over able, ever able to take the offensive. Meanwhile, the U.S. ambassador in Jakarta and the difficult task of maintaining the semblance that the rebels were acting on their own and that the United States was not involved as if to strengthen his hand, the chief of naval op operations, then Admiral Arlie Burke, sent his chief of intelligence to Jakarta right at the time as much as if to say that certainly there was no U.S. military involvement in these attacks. It was an unusual rebellion with the CIA doing all it could to help the rebels and with covert over U.S. government officials doing all they, they could to maintain normal relations. Then during an air attack on the Indonesian supply vessel, one of the B-26 bombers was shot down. The plot and the pilot grew and crew were rescued. The pilot turned out to be an American and his crew was mixed with other nations. The American Alan Pope had in its possession all kinds of routine identification documents, including a set of U.S. Air Force orders that proved beyond any doubt that he was an active U.S. Air Force pilot. The only choice left for the Indonesians was to assume that he was either Air Force pilot flying for the U.S. Air Force or that he was at the Air Force pilot flying in support of the rebels claimed as timely as direction of the CIA. Things had not been going well and the other CIA assistants had been compromised. It was no longer, it was not longer before rebel activity was limited to remote areas where government control had never been strong in the first place. General Nazushin continued to a mop up campaign and the rebellion came to an end. There were many who asked when Alan Pope came up for trial in Jakarta, how it happened that a man who was flying clandestine missions would have been carrying so much and such complete identification with him, why he had not been subjected to a search and other controls that would have assumed that he would have been stateless and plausibly deniable if captured. These same questions were asked after Gary Powers had been captured in the Soviet Union after his U-2 landed there in 1960. The usual procedure required that the aircraft and all records that might originally have been aboard the plane and other airborne materials be sanitized before the plane is used on any clandestine mission and considerable amount of money had been spent by the Air Force to assure that these B-26 aircraft had been sanitized and that all airborne equipment was deniable. At the forward base where Alan Pope and the other pilots were operating, the CIA was supposed to assure that all crew members were sanitized. This required that they enter a crew room, strip naked, and then be examined by proper authority. From that room, they would enter another bare room where, but ne where nothing but the flight clothes they would wear would be available. That's stupid. It's like some dumb spy thing, though. So stupid. All personnel effects and other identification would be removed and left in the first room. From this second room, the crew would be driven directly to their aircraft. I think it has to do with, like, losing your identity or something. But there's got to be more to it than that because they're not that spiritual. However, all crew members, as all other members of the human race, have a strong sense of survival. And they know very well that if they are captured... Oh, see, maybe I'm right. This is smart and declared to be stateless, they will have no legal means to appeal to the U.S. or to any other nation, and they will be shot as spies in accordance with custom. On the other hand, if they are captured and can prove beyond any doubt that they are American, they are, then they become valuable pawns on the other hands of their captors. So they were literally, I knew there was something bad. They brainwashed the CIA too, by the way. The nation that has captured them can deal privately with the U.S. government in a form of top-level international blackmail. The lives of the men involved become a minor importance by the time, by that time to both countries compared to the advantages that the capturing country can wring out of the loser with the threat of exposure of the facts of the case. I'd be like, um, yeah, let me tell you all about it. I don't really care if you kill me or not, but I am going to tell you everything.
Everything? Yes, everything. I'll tell you exactly everything. <laughs> No, I am not a spy. I'm just a psychic. I'm a psychic spy. I'm a psychic. No, I'm just a psychic. This is a key factor in the case in the president pri prisoner of war problem with Hanau. Those prisoners, many of whom were captured under unusual circumstances in accordance with the compacts signed in Geneva, have become a much more valuable asset to the government of Hanau than what might be called the usual prisoner of war, as in World War II. What, with this in mind, it can be said that every agent takes precautionary measures on his own to see that he has some identifying material with him if he can possibly get away with it. It is entirely possible that the crew of the captured B-26 and their identification hidden in the plane, and they, they retrieved it once they were in the air, this must have been the case because the official reports from the base were where they had departed on the mission stated that they had gone through the inspection process outlined above. In spite of all of this, the Indonesian government was able to produce at Alan Pope's trial copies of his recently dated Air Force orders which had transferred him to the Philippines. They had his Air Force identification card and a current post exchange card for Clark Air Force base Manila and such other documents, there would be no doubt in, uh, in their minds that Alan Pote was a current Air Force pilot and that he was flying in support of the rebels and for the CIA. Such evidence is all they need to expose the hand of the U.S. and to lay this government open to pressures. Students and researchers of subsequent actions in Indonesia may have noted that the Pope case and all that is exposed has cost his government heavily in the years that followed. Although Pope had been captured in 1958, it remained for Bobby Kennedy during the administration of President Kennedy to complete some of his remaining payoff. The Indonesian campaign was no... That whole family is corrupt. Look at Schreiber. Look at the daughter. Hi, I'm a mom and I am an actress and I wrote a book about my evil father, how he abused my mom and I made it all about me and forgiveness. However, I don't even really forgive him. I just wanted to write a book. Uh, yeah, I manipulated Chris Pratt into la, 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 la. and he started praying to Jesus for help. Help me. Uh. And then I showed up. And then me and Chris Pratt hooked up. And now we're in love. And I flipped him far, too. I think I spent, once I spent like an hour flipping you or something. Stuff. The Indonesian campaign was so it was no small matter. It marked the entry of the CIA into the big time. And just so you let you know, the only one that was really good was the Kennedy that was killed. No, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Hold on. Junior. John Kennedy Jr. I really like him and his wife. Maybe not the wife. I don't know. They always trick me. Its failure also marked the beginning of a most unusual career for the CIA. It seemed that the more the CIA failed, the more it grew and prospered. As a direct immediate result of the failure, the Eisenhower administration made a searching review of what had happened. Unlike the Bay of Pigs investigation three years later, this review was not made in public and it, has not, it was not as gentle on the main participants. The leader of all the CIA activity in Southeast Asia at that time of the Indonesian action was Frank Wisner. He was then the deputy director of plans for the CIA. He had gone to Singapore himself to head the operation rather than delegate was important task to somewhere, someone else. Wisner was delivered, Wisner was relieved of duty with the agency along with several other, other top officials and the whole team that had worked on the program was broken up and scattered in the four winds of agency assignments. This bro, brusque, Action by Eisenhower, although properly justified, led to certain events 
that had left their record upon history. The activist is an Eisenhower administration who had gone along with Alan Dulles and Frank Wisner on his campaign, was the vice president, Richard Nixon. Anyone wearing a mask right now is sad and pathetic. Everyone. It's embarrassing to look at. I even see people alone in their car wearing a mask. So you just basically are hiding something. And then I wanted to let everybody know that um, the only th reasons you wore masks, and just to let you know, I worked in the dental field during this process. I worked in the dental field. Never got sick. This close to your mouth breathing in my face. And all we did was take your temperature and then ask you if you'd been exposed to COVID. And the likely answer to that was yes. So while Kim Kardashian told you to get back to work and make fabric clothing uh, six feet away from you, um, I was working less than what, a, like less than a yardstick close to people. And then they utilized it as a battleground to control and to be, be like um, better than. And then they started arguing within their own circle because who do you think you are? I'm in Black Lives Matter. And then they would be like, who do you think you are? I'm in Black Lives Matter. I'm a leader. No, I'm a leader. No, I am. Well, I'm a comedian. Well, I run the show in this place. And so you have to take a look at the argument within the argument within the argument within the argument. How pathetic. Also, the man who yielded the cudgel when it came time to clean house was the name Richard Nixon. In the government civil service safe haven, see, they get, they get like a jump off off of it. Instead of like doing right by people, which is like saying hi to white babies and being nice to white kids. Because they were abusive to white kids, too. That's how pathetic you Black Lives Matter people are. And then you try to shelter your black kids from us. You're pathetic, is all I can say. Anyway, I'm coming for them all anyway, so it doesn't matter. In the government civil service safe haven, is, it is one... Meanwhile, they go home and beat the shit out of them. And they never advance themselves into seeing ways to get themselves out from the bottom. With perfect potential opportunities to know that loans were available for you and education for college. On the job training programs. And a long list of, of because you are black, you were given opportunity more opportunity than the white people, yet you called yourself a minority and then you started springing out Black Lives Matter because Trayvon Martin had a knife and a gun on him and he was trying to rob somebody and then some guy protecting his neighborhood killed him. Who deserved, Trayvon deserved to die because mommy cried. Mommy cried. And then you blame a white guy who's getting beat to shit by a black dude and he defends himself and then you put his ass on trial. <laughs> Sorry, bitch. You going down. I don't give a shit what color you are, white or black. You getting shot in the face. I don't care if you Mexican. I don't care if you Chinese. You attacking me, you going fucking down, bitch. However, you like to make you the innocent when you're wearing all kinds of ghetto-ass clothes, driving a ghetto-ass car, selling drugs in the ghetto, and not going to your classes or going to get an education. And then when the cop shows up, you totally disrespect him. You're getting shot. And I ain't going to hear your fucking mouth, you ugly bitch. And you know exactly who I'm talking to, Kanye. Fuck you, you ugly whore. You need to sit down and shut your fucking mouth. You're just a has-been actress that nobody wanted to watch with your nasty fucking attitude. Not even Whoopi Goldberg liked your ass. 
I'm not even sure if you a woman or not. The deep of your voice. And the government civil service safe haven is one thing to censure and to wring hands, but is an entirely different matter actually to fire someone and release him from the protective cocoon of government service. Since the Indonesian campaign was technically anyway highly classified, I'm a, I'm a CIA agent. <laughs> Most other government workers did not know why all these nice people had been fired, and since they were cool to Nixon anyhow... It rose in unison to damn him and when he ran for president in 1960. This in turn led to other events of some magnitude when Eisenhower directed Alan Dulles to brief Kennedy and Nixon. Equally during the campaign, Dulles had briefed each of them according to his idea of what each needed to know. He knew that this was up to date on his things in the anti-Castro campaign. And so he did not have to go into detail on what, on that with him. And when he briefed Kennedy, he gave the same briefing, being strictly fair and equal. This meant that Kennedy had not been briefed as fully as anti-Castro plans as Eisenhower might have thought desirable. Alan Dulles was able to report when challenged that he had been briefed them both equally and they had not gone into the detail of that covert campaign. Excuse me, Cuban campaign. Later, Bay of Pigs, this will be discussed in, derail, in detail later. However, the other CIA officials at a well, level well below Alan Dulles did see to it that Kennedy knew all there was to know about the anti-Castro campaign and everything else that might help him in his bitter and strenuous campaign against Nixon. Thus, Nixon, who carefully observed the limits of security, was at a considerable disadvantage, and Kennedy, who, had, who could take the stance that he was not officially aware of classified things of the nature, could use anything he chose against Nixon. The insistence that he got across the board from the multi-million civil servant reservoir of goodwill easily provides sufficient to tip the scales of that very close election in favor of John F. Kennedy. It is interesting to see how proper action at the time of Indonesia debacle backlash against the man who carried it out as a member of the NSC with one deputy director of plans gone and with the agency scrambling to find something to do after it had withdrawn from the area of Indonesia. Alan Dulles turned his attention to the U-2, which had become operational on a grand scale. He made the direction, the director of the U-2 program of the new deputy director of plans for the agency that's promoting Richard Bizzle to the highest clandestine operation spot in the U.S. government. Meanwhile, the P2V7 project continued to grow and to operate on a worldwide scale, as did the U2 project. The agency also got itself involved in lesser activities all over the world. It was active in Iran and Ethiopia. It stepped up its world in Laos and Thailand and is very actively supporting the Chinese nationalists in their penetration operations into the mainland. Then in May of 1959, the agency found itself again involved in one of those totally unexpected catastrophes that seemed to occur when least expected and least desired. So I don't like you 2 the band. And I do believe that you two took that from the CIA operative. And I do believe that he's working with uh, Obama. So Coldplay wan, wan won. And you two is out. There is not a vibe in that song that I like. And I tried. Then you better start talking, dude, with your ugly ass mustache and your ugly ass do rag. You don't know shit about America. You don't know shit about shit. And you don't know shit about what peace is. However, you be singing about it like you do. You love in the publicity. You love being in control. You love being powerful. Just like John Stewart. Some of the ugliest people I've ever seen in my life with the worst fucking personalities. And I get along with every fucking body. Psychotic fuck. <laughs>